everyone. Welcome back to my podcast. I'm Crystal Hefner, and this is Beneath the Surface. Right now, each week, I am going beneath the surface of my new book. It is called Only Say Good Things, Surviving Playboy and Finding Myself. This is the UK cover that I really, really like. This is my specific book is my favorite one that I've been just working off of. Uh, yeah, I really love the UK cover and the US cover. So I've been going chapter by chapter each week through the book. Today, I am going to go over chapter five, which I've had to have a little breather before going through this because I've been talking about everything nonstop. There's been a lot of press, which I'm very grateful for. Right now I'm on the Australia leg of the press and everyone there has been very, very nice. I am appreciative. After I go through the chapter, I will be answering some more of your Q&A questions that I got in. Part two of the podcast will be answering your questions. So let's dive in. Chapter five, Silk Pajamas, very fitting title. All right, I'm going to read you part of this chapter. I carefully held the pajamas up off the ground as I wriggled out of my French made corset and peeled down my fishnets. I didn't know what to do with my costume, so I carefully folded it up and placed it on a chair, like I was in a dressing room at a clothing boutique. I slipped into the pajamas. I stumbled a little, ste stepping into the silk. I knew I had too much to drink, but it helped with the nerves. The silk was cold and impossibly slippery. The pajamas were enormous on me. It didn't matter. I grasped at this point I wouldn't be wearing them very long. I imagined what it would be like to have so much money that you could afford to buy something in every color. The Italian silk felt luxurious on my body, and I was grateful to get out of the tight costume. At the mansion, this was wealth beyond even my parents' fantasy of making it big. I had stepped into a scene from Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, a show my parents used to watch, and I was in awe. I felt even more driven to make a good impression, do everything right. For one night, I wanted to pretend that this exclusive world was my world. I took a deep breath. In the bedroom, the lights were dim, and Madonna was playing from the ceiling speakers, a weirdly upbeat dance song that gave everything a surreal edge. Each one of the four televisions was playing porn. It looked vintage, like something filmed in the 70s or 80s. You could tell by the colors and the giant sideburns on the men and all the pubic hair on the women. The actors were all oiled up and writhing around on pool tables. Was this his idea of a sexy scene? I pushed the questioning thoughts away. I didn't pause to analyze it. I knew I had a part to play. <sighs> so everyone, or let, let's say most people that I interview with, they want to know about the sex. Like <laughs> I even got a comment recently that said, oh, forget about your feelings. We just want to know about the sex stuff. Obviously the sex stuff happened. I really don't don't understand like the huge fas fascination with the sex part. I really don't because it was probably the least fascinating part of it for me. It was something where everyone was there just to please Hef and do whatever Hef wanted. And I'm sure that's, I'm, I'm sure that's some people's fantasy or whatever. But uh, Hef really didn't know how to return the favor, I guess. The the term I'm, I've learned from my favorite Australian interviews I've been doing is called a dud root. And that means that the person is not good in bed. Before the mansion, I was in a relationship for a long time with somebody that I really loved and adored. And the, se the sexual aspect of it was great and beautiful and romantic. But when it came to the mansion, it was very transactional that's just what what have wanted he just wanted i don't know us to put on some kind of show so it was all fake the girls kind of pretended to be into each other i mean i know people keep wanting me to like spill the tea and say so much more about all of that but it's like i don't know what like how much more like to explain it you know hef was pretty checked out you know, he would turn on his, he had these like, it was like an Austin Powers kind of control table on the left-hand side and he would press press these buttons and the screens would come on. A couple of them were like flat screens and then regular TVs above that. And um, yeah, he had these porn tapes and they were, I don't, I really don't know where they came from, but they were old. They were kind of vintage seeming. Yeah, there were some scenes with like oil and the people were rubbing all like all, on each other and on pool tables and I think he would just be so into watching what's on this tv and he watched the same one over and over so I maybe he liked the familiarity I'm not sure but he would put those on the screens and he would get a 
it's like a wooden box out of a cabinet and it had joints in it and his friends a couple of his friends like smoked weed and they would bring joints for like gifts for Hef and so he would take these joints out of this little wooden box and like light one up and you know take some puffs and pass it around to, to the other girls and the weed wasn't something I was very much into so I would just kind of pretend you know pass it to the next person and you know Hef would wear his like mm, like flannel pajamas they're like blue flannel and he, I remember he would like just be laying there and he would like unbutton, like, I don't know if it was like the whole top, but a lot of it and like make it so his like nipples showed. And then I remember he would get like baby oil and like rub it on himself and then like on his nipples a bit. I do remember that. Yeah. I don't know if he like took his pants all the way off. I don't remember, but the whole thing, I know some people, I don't, a lot of people are like really intrigued, but the whole thing was something I don't know it's like you're you kind of have to do it or if you're going to be there I obviously didn't have the tools then that I have now and knowing that it was a choice and I never said no or I don't want to or I don't feel like it so I know a lot of people now just give me a hard time about that but I was there and I I knew from my previous relationship what it was like to have a real intimate moment with somebody and that wasn't it I don't know if Hef thought the other girls were into each other, but none of us were. None of us were into each other. We just kind of pretended. And at that time, the twins were living there and they're sisters. And Hef expected them to be into each other, which is gross, which is really, really gross. And I know I've talked about somewhere where he would like lay down and have the twins on either side of him and like look up at this mirror above the bed and and, and be like, oh, my babies and look up and... Yeah, he was 81 and they were 19. But the media really praised this person. And so when I, when I, the voice, my inner voice was telling me like, hey, this is wrong or this is gross or weird. I would just like push it down. And he was praised at that time. Like he was praised so much by the world. So I'm like, okay, you know, I should feel lucky that I'm here and just do what's like asked of me. And so I just ignored how I was feeling um and just went along with it and I thought okay if I'm gonna be here I'm just gonna try and be I don't know the best I can for half there was a huge power imbalance yeah a lot of it was hard and a lot of it was abusive in a way the that oil that half used gave us all infections I know there were a lot of like cancer cases with Johnson and Johnson's like the talc powder like gave people like ovarian cancer and stuff I don't know about any cases with the oil but they would give us infections that's it's like uh, like yeast infections and like bacterial vaginosis, which I didn't even know what that was. So there are things ha- that happen there that like I wish that I didn't have that experience. Like looking back, I'm like, oh, I wish I wasn't like tainted with this or have been through some stuff that, you know, I wish I could delete it. Like some friends I know that you know, they married their high school sweetheart and they're still together and they haven't had to go through any weird things. And sometimes I envy those people. You know, it happened and that was just part of it there. And chapter five really details going upstairs for the first time that first night. Well, I didn't know like if that was going to be expected of me or what. Yeah, it happened and it's, it's all in here and I don't have anything to hide. So when people ask me stuff, I, I answer the best of my ability you know the mansion was a place that I was initially really drawn to like I came from a completely broken home and I saw women in the pages of Playboy and I thought they were powerful and strong and had the world at their feet and I would see women like Pam Anderson, Jenny McCarthy, Carmen Electra yeah back then it's like okay I need to make myself like appealing to a man to the opposite sex so I think that was that was my journey at one point. I contributed to the misogyny of the world and I regret it. But at the same time, I didn't have the tools. I didn't know any better. The world was different. This is pre me too. This is when somebody, you know, half was praised, like I said. You know, now I have the tools. Now I would say no if I was in any situation being asked to do something I didn't want to do or didn't feel comfortable doing. You know, this is a situation where you're expected to be like, it, having this intimate type of act but it's awkward and weird and plus add in strangers that you don't even know and you have to be around them naked it's weird it's not something that was easy at all it is hard 
kind of feeling that you have to go along with something that you don't really want to do. And so I just really hope that this story helps people. I didn't love myself enough when I was there, even more like I didn't respect myself enough when I was there. And I do feel that if you respect yourself and you love yourself, then you won't let anybody treat you like less than nurturing. And if something doesn't feel right, you'll leave like immediately. I think everyone has that that ability to really dig dig deep and have that power to really love and really respect yourself. I think it's important. When I was there, I was definitely like emotionally manipulated by half and emotionally abused by half. And it's hard. It's hard being in a relationship or whatever that was with somebody who, you know, is more powerful than you and can pretty much override you and tell you what to do and how to behave and all those things. So yeah, anyone that's being abused emotionally or you know, I was also abused financially because he would give us this allowance every Friday. And you definitely felt like you're having to like ask for money and like holding your hand out and having to beg for it. And he counts out the bills like 100, 200 and hands it to you. And yeah, it did feel like cheap, gave us enough to where we were okay, but not enough to where we could actually leave. So if anyone is in a emotionally abusive or financially abusive relationship, you know, I hope that you find the courage and the self-worth and the self-respect to not deal with anyone that makes your life that way. And if someone's financially abusing you, just try and save, 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 save as much as you can when you can to be able to get out of it. But yeah, I've been telling this story. I have nothing to hide. I do feel that the relationship was so public for so long and Hef himself was just such a public person He would tell everyone that his life is an open book. He would just candidly answer anything. And he did control the narrative for so long, for like 70 years. And so I do feel that it is time for other voices to come out of the mansion. It's part of the reason I wrote this book. I started with stories. I also (laughs) realized like, okay, that half was very misogynistic. I didn't realize that when I was in in the mansion. He was narcissistic. I didn't have boundaries. I only learned what boundaries were a couple years ago. And I think those are really important to enact, you know, gravitate toward what you love and gravitate toward people that treat you right. And if they don't treat you right, block them out of your lives, even if it means like your family. And sadly enough, you know, they should be on the list too if if they're not treating you well or they're abusive, like just try and get those kind of people out of your life. I've asked people like if they have any questions about any of the stuff like the the mansion, the heft stuff, the sex stuff. Like I'm, I'm an open book and people can ask me whatever they want. So with that, like I try and think of like what more tea like I can give because it's like what what do people want to know? Do, do they want me to describe things more or set the scene better or because I feel like there's only so many ways to say the same thing. And there's been other stories coming out of this place where, you know, it is, it is kind of similar, like the, the routine and everything was very similar. Yeah. I really, I really hope that, you know, you guys are getting something out of this book. I'm, I am getting a lot of people that are in abusive relationships and they're reading this book and it's really helping them. Also, it's, it's a different perspective that's more on the psychology side of, why I ended up there like I was broken and ended up there and Hef was broken as a child and ended up you know using and abusing people and I know some people say like oh okay it wasn't that bad or all whatever like when I was in it I didn't think it was that bad but now reflecting back it's really hard because I do think I'm like okay did did Playboy like help the world or hurt the world and then you think of Playboy supposed to be being like this place of freedom and expression and it wasn't. It wasn't for me. It was it was hard. Being Hef's like girlfriend and wife, like it makes you feel very trapped. And so that illusion of freedom through play the Playboy brand was just completely shattered for me. Uh I think about when Hef very first started the magazine, he bought calendar photos uh from a calendar company. Marilyn Monroe had d- had done a pinup shoot for a calendar company and some of the photos were nude. And people knew these images existed but they hadn't seen them and she was like an up-and-coming you know movie star and she probably maybe was pushed by the photographer to do this nude shoot or just wanted to do it and not realize like her likeness and rights were just going to be completely taken from her but Hef bought the photos of Marilyn for $700 from a calendar company put them in the first issue of Playboy 
And that's what started his empire. Marilyn Monroe was used and exploited and got paid nothing. And that's what created the whole empire. And now he's buried next to her and she didn't have a say in that either. So yeah, there, there's, there's just all kinds of stories and things that I'm confused about still to this day. With that all being said, I'm just moving forward still and just trying to make sense of things as I go along. I hope those of you who read the book have enjoyed it. That yesterday I got into an elevator. I was in a, you know, fancy big sky rise in Century City seeing my lawyer. And after I got in the elevator and there's like three people dressed very professionally, like two women and a man and the elevator closes and we're all in there. Elevator rides are awkward, especially if you're an introvert. And and the the woman looks at me, one of the women look at look at me looks at me and says, I just read your book. And I'm in the elevator. I'm like, oh my gosh. She's like, well the audiobook, but yeah, it's great. And then the guy says, oh, what's it called? I'm like, oh, it's called Only Say Good Things. And, you know, you'll understand when, when you when you read it. But um, yeah, it was interesting. It's cool that the, the book's being read and listened to. And I just appreciate it. So thank you so much. I really had no idea how it was going to be received, but it's being received very well. And I am so grateful for that. And so next... <laughs> I am going to answer some more of your questions because I know you guys like it when I answer your questions. I want to answer more questions, but I'm, I'm a little bit of a catch-22 right now because the internet isn't always a nice place. I'm a firm believer in if you have nothing nice to say, just don't say anything. A lot of comments have been kind of rude and terrible, so I've turned them off for now. It saves my mental health. I highly recommend it. So we'll see what happens in the future, but for now, they are off. But I do have lots of questions that have already been asked. So I will open them up, answer them for the last part of this podcast. Somebody asked, it's Danielle Chan 300. What did Hef think of the mansion having mold issues? So at that time, Hef had sold the company and the company owned the mansion. And I remember saying like, there's mold in here. There's something wrong because my Lyme disease doctor, she tested me for everything. She te- and then she tested my, uh, she did like a swab up the nose and that had mycotoxins, which which is mold. And then I did a urine test and I had mold in it. I did a blood test, had mold, like four different types of mold. I let the company know. I think they sent somebody and then said it was fine. Then my mold doctor recommended somebody. So I had him come over and he found fungus in the vents, right in the vanity, the closet that was my space. And uh, yeah, it was a big mold problem. And I let Hef know and he didn't seem to care. He really didn't. I do think that the mold compromised his immune system, you know, which led him to not recover from when he got sick with the E. coli infection. But yeah, I don't think mold is something he took seriously. I think a lot of people still don't take mold seriously. And mold can really affect you. It can really inflame your brain. It can really damage children's brains when they're developing. It can cause so many autoimmune conditions in brain fog, memory loss, so much, so much stuff. But yeah, Hef, I think a lot of people of Hef's generation, like they didn't really believe in like germs or mold, but yeah, that, that was that. So thanks for asking. Hank underscore Scorpio 96. How is your relationship with Hugh Hefner's family after the book's been out? I forget if I answered this question already, but um, I'm going to be going to Disneyland with one of Hef's children here soon. And yeah, and I had Marston on the podcast the first episode and I think they understand that it's complicated. Better Cali Life. Are you planning to go on some podcasts with some YouTubers like Real Randy Chavez? I have been doing so much press and so many podcasts, and I am so grateful for everyone that wants me to be on their podcasts. But it is kind of like, you know, having to talk about the same stuff over and over and over, which is hard. It gets hard because for so long, I was quiet for so long. I was quiet for like five years or longer. And I just was so happy to be actually living my best life and being happy, actually living my life and <laughs> in general and being free, having freedom. You know, I found out that I really liked traveling. So I was traveling a lot. Then I spent a lot of time in Hawaii and ended up being, buying a farm out there. Uh, I have, you know, one time I had maybe eight properties um, in Los Angeles between West Hollywood and Malibu. So I really like flipping and renovating properties. I sold them like a lot of them around COVID. Um, And now I have three properties in California. 
and three properties in Hawaii. And so I've just been enjoying my life and not thinking really about the Playboy Mansion or anything there. Yeah, so it's it's hard to keep keep go, you know, rehashing it and rehashing it. And I want to get into talking about other things because I think if I had things that I felt were missing, I would have never ended up at the mansion. I would have done something else. So yeah, I do want to get into like self-worth and, and value and all those things. Okay, I'm going to keep this person anonymous because I don't know if, if they want me to publicly talk about this. But they said, I started writing a book last year on poly slash BDSM relationship and reliving hurts. Yeah. So touching back on the last question, like I'm somebody who just wants to be in a normal, like, I don't know, like one-on-one relationship. I think more than that is is hard for me. I just I just want to love one person. And so it was hard, like wrapping my brain around the fact that, okay, this person wants multiple people in the bedroom. Like I was trying to, I was trying to wrap my hand around, like, did, could they really love me? I'm not sure. Uh, Robin Pierce, how often did Hef wash his bed sheets? Love you, by the way. Great book. That's a great question. Toward the end, I feel like it was washed every day. He had like black satin sheets. He never wanted white sheets. He hated hospitals. He said people go to die in hospitals and he wouldn't have white sheets on his bed because it reminded him of a hospital. So he had black satin sheets and there were lots of sets of the sheets. They were all custom and they would get replaced. Katie says, following up on book pics on Audible, can you please post the picture from the book now? I can post the photos from the book. That's a great idea. I'll put them on my, um, either on the grid or story, but the Audible comes with a PDF. So there should be an option that says, you know, view PDF of of the the book and all the photos should be in there with the Audible. We made sure that they're all in there. Courtney Lauren, what was the hardest chapter for you to write? I think it was chapter five, the one that we just kind of touched on. Um, it was it was hard. But I do feel that the book tells a comprehensive story, which I'm, I'm very proud of. Allison, Vegas. Love the book. I could relate to you a few times. Going to write another book someday. I think if I wrote another book, it would be like a self-help type of book and ways that I've kind of, you know, got, got back to myself, like finding the path back to yourself after going through something that's hard. Yeah, just finding yourself and loving yourself and knowing your self-worth. Because I think if we love ourselves and respect ourselves and are secure in ourselves, then we don't end up in bad relationships we don't end up in things that are less than nurturing we don't end up in things that make us question ourselves and our lives so I think it's important to work on yourself and be secure in yourself and don't be with people that don't respect you or even that even in friendships family any of that stuff it's you know it's important to get those people out of your lives John Reed 1123 do you think the twins would have stuck around if the Girls Next Door show didn't exist? I think the twins were young. They were 19. And so they didn't want to be stuck in a mansion at some old man's schedule. It's like a weird cruise ship itinerary schedule. And it just wasn't for them. I think I had nothing and I was such a people pleaser that I'm like, okay, I know that if I wasn't here, like there's nothing else for me. So I don't know. I just didn't have any self-worth or I was so insecure that I just thought that was my only option. So I just did whatever I could. I molded myself to be exactly what Hef wanted me to be. I completely lost myself there. And they still had their personality. And I, I appreciate that for, for them. How was Hef after Holly's book came out? Was he upset or did he not care? I remember being at the mansion when Holly's book came out. I remember Hef being upset. Yeah, he wrote a statement saying something about she twisted the truth or something. And and I remember being just completely team half, like, oh, how dare she, like, you know, bite the hand that feeds her and she would be nothing without this place and all that stuff. But later on, like after I left the mansion and had therapy and started realizing like the narcissism, misogyny and all these things, boundaries, like you couldn't have boundaries there. Once I realized all that, like, okay, everything... Holly said is is true it is very true you know I I do feel bad that I didn't recognize that right away 
And it's, it is really hard when you're in something. When you're in something abusive, it's hard to see. There are people that I know that are still in abusive relationships, and it's hard. It's hard to get out of. You know, these are people that can also be charming. These are bad people that are good sometimes. And I think some people hang on to the good. When the bad comes, they just roll with it. But I think if, if people have the tendency to be bad even sometimes, you shouldn't give them the time of day. Allison, Allison's asking uh, good questions. Did you ever talk to Greg's parents again since writing the book at the mansion? I haven't spoken to Greg's parents. I do want to let them know that people are reading about him, that the book has become a bestseller. It's been in a lot of, you know, a lot of people's in front of a lot of people's eyes and ears. So I think it's important that people are still like reading and hearing about Greg. Another question from Allison. There's so much doubt online about Hef wanting a small funeral. Did he really not care? <sighs> I remember, I mean, this is how it happened. So Hef's a state attorney. I'm not going to say his name. He said to me one day, he's like, do you know Hef's wishes? Like after he passes away, it's not something he talks about. He hasn't told me any of that. And I did think like, okay, maybe, you know, he probably saw himself as immortal. I saw him as immortal. You know, he was an older man for so long. And so, yeah, I thought he was going to be around forever. But I do remember like, okay, I think I'm the only person as his wife that could probably get like get these answers so people have them so they can respect his wishes. And I do remember one night we were watching this movie. It was called A Man Called Ove or something like that. I think there's been a remake with uh, Tom Hanks since. But it's about an older man who is lonely and depressed and he tries to kill himself like several times. But he gets interrupted. You know, there's like a family or someone needs help or something. So the movie like has the theme of death all the way through. And after it was over... And we went upstairs, Hef said, you know, you know where I want to be buried, right? Like, you know, I bought the plot Westwood Memorial next to Marilyn Monroe. That's where I want to be buried. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know that. And then I said, and for your funeral, like, what what would you want that to look like? And he said, I don't care. I'm going to leave that up to you. I won't be here. Like, I don't care. And so I said to him, I said, I think, you know, I think I have an idea of like who your close friends are. And he said, yeah, do whatever you want. Like, I won't be here. So after Hef passed away, we had a small little funeral at Westwood Memorial where he wanted to be buried. It was just his family and his doctor and his secretary and me. And my mom was there too. His head of security, Rick, who he adored. Yeah, we laid him to rest there. And then we had a memorial at the house. And that wasn't too much bigger, but the, we had the memorial there and yeah. And then, and that was it. I remember him telling the scrapbook people like, please put the obituaries and everything in the scrapbook and, and, end the scrapbook. And I think, I think that's what happened. And that's what they did. Jess 1055. Have you reached out to Holly? Yeah. I've talked to her one time we were going to meet up at Disneyland and it didn't end up working out. Um, I know they recently like got upset with me. I, I don't know. I just, I think it's all petty and I think we should just all get along, but we will see. And Halen says, please go on the girls next level podcast. Love you girly. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, um, talk to them, but at some point, like I'm going to go back to just letting all this be in the past because 10 years of my life was lost to the mansion. And if I keep like rehashing it, like I'm in my thirties now, and like it took my entire 20s and now I'm in my 30s. And if I'm just like keep rehashing this stuff over and over and over, like I'm going to be wasting <laughs> another decade of my life. So I do want to move forward and talk about things that are important to me. But OK, so I think I think I've answered a lot of these questions and there are more questions that I will answer in a future post. But I really appreciate you guys being here and checking out podcast about chapter five in the book and I'm just going to continue to chat to you guys I, I love you I you're so amazing and kind and supportive and those of you who have always been there for me I appreciate you and I will continue to appreciate you yeah just just follow the light and follow the people that love you and ignore the rest that's the advice I'm going to leave all of us with all right I love you Take care and I'll see you next time. <laughs>